I was split on the situation. On one hand, I get to hunt Grimm, something I took pride in and was proficient at. On the other hand, I just got off the damn airship, and now I'm going on another one. I cracked my neck and refocused, putting my hand on the handle of my sword. Well, my dear, looks like it's time to show how we from Teodal hunt. I smirk, looking at the rabbit fawn as a nod. Amethyst falling close behind us as we walk towards the ship. Amethyst. Yes, my prince. You are to be partnered with Olivia. I want to find my own partner, okay? I just don't know why you can't just partner up with Olivia. I mean, she is your... Amethyst. Olivia interrupted with her usual calm demeanor. I looked at her. I could tell she wasn't happy that I was so determined to be partnered with someone else. I equally could tell in her eyes that she understood why I was doing this. She gripped my hand and kissed it. Rowan is doing this for himself. That is something that we, as his family, should encourage. For him to be chieftain, he needs to be confident on his own, let alone with me. Yes, my lady. But it still feels wrong. It very much does. However, he's always going to come back to us. Right, Rowan? I chuckled a little bit. The tone and stare she was giving me left no room for a negative response. So I nodded. Good. Then I have no objection. We stepped on the airship as more students filed on. I didn't like this. If something went wrong, there was such a slim chance that people would survive the crash. They should have gathered more airships for something like this. How many were there? Five? Six? These were just carrier airships from what I understood. Olivia gripped my hand, refocusing me on the now. My pr- uh, Rowan, are you sure you won't need assistance? We don't know what's down there. Amethyst, you need to stop worrying over others for a moment. We're going down there too. Focus on your survival. Our Rowan will be fine. He is our future chieftain, and he is much more capable than- Yes, milady. You are right, of course. Olivia looked around, seemingly no one was looking at us. And she kissed me. As long as you keep in mind that if you die, I will find a way to go to the afterlife and drag your sorry soul back to life. I smiled and put her face into my hands. I wouldn't think of dying. She smiled and closed her eyes. She gripped my hands and took them off her face. Glad we have that understanding. Now, we're getting closer soon. Good luck. The side doors opened on the aircraft. I looked at Olivia and smiled, turning my head to Amethyst. I nod as she steps back. I noticed other students just leaping out of the aircraft. I let out a breath and launched myself out into the open air. It felt strange. An emotional cocktail of exhilaration, fear, determination. The fall accelerated for a time as I looked for an ideal place to land. The landing would be simple enough, use my semblance to make sure my descent doesn't accelerate too far, and use my aura to take any amount of shock from the actual landing itself. I found an unfinished frame of a building and decided to make that my destination. Using my semblance three times to vanish and reappear closer to the construct, and landed on one of the metal girders that had been placed gods know how long ago. Dark, partially rusted metal beneath my feet, my legs shook slightly from the impact, but I maintained my balance and focus. I surveyed the area around me. The first thing I noticed was that these unfinished buildings seemed common for the area. I sighed and said a silent prayer to those who were lost during the evacuation of the Mount Glen settlement. I heard several screeches coming closer, ending my prayer early. I growled at myself. I fucking hate Nevermores. I drew my sword, turning my head around as quickly as I could, trying to figure out where they were coming from. After the futile efforts, I decided to look straight up to see three medium-sized Nevermore coming down. They pulled back up and all extended their wings and threw them together to shoot their razor-sharp feathers. I swung down the girder I was standing on to the one beneath it, hearing the pangs of the bladed feathers make contact with the old steel. Unfortunately, with old rusted steel comes weakness and structure, causing me to lose my balance and fall onto the landing beneath me, this time not so graceful. The relentless assault did not let up as the Nevermore forced me to backroll to my feet to dodge another volley of arrows. 
If there was one downside of my family's tradition, it would be that the fact we don't use ranged weapons. I growled and held my sword at the ready and started searching around for any possible escape and heard a howl behind me. I closed my eyes and let out a breath and turned my head to look behind me. Sure enough, a small pack of Beowulfs. Day just keeps getting better and better. Okay, now I'm cornered. Three Nevermore, four Beowulfs. Perfect. Ideally, I would go after the Beowulfs. Sure, I'm still unnumbered, but they are at least within striking range of Jaded Thorn. These stupid birds? Not so much. I felt as if the gods were mocking me. All the big talk that I need to handle things myself, and now the one Grim that I have trouble killing has to show up without anyone that can use literally any kind of ranged weaponry within yelling distance. Before I could make a plan, the Nevermores fired their feathers again, causing me to roll to the side to dodge. While I was still crouched, a Beowulf lunged at me. I used my semblance to teleport away, and the wolf-like Grim landed exactly where I was standing. Alright, Mocking Gods, fine. We'll play your game. Whether the gods had anything to do with this unfortunate situation, I had no idea. But it felt good blaming someone for this. I dove forward and went for a stab until I saw the feathers oncoming. I teleported again to the side of the Beowulf and stabbed the Beowulf between his external rib armor, making it vanish. Okay, three Beowulves and three Nevermore. I looked at the birds as they flew in circles, eyes trained on me. I turned to observe the Beowulves. They seem to take things more cautiously now. I wonder if the Beowulf I killed was the leader, or at the very least, the strongest. Though the disappointing thing about Beowulves, and honestly Grimm in general, they didn't have a retreat instinct. They'll just eventually keep attacking whatever aura they sense. However, there was a standstill for now. The Nevermore will be a problem. I could theoretically run for it, but they can cover more ground and have some sort of ranged ability... Plus, the Beowulves would run me down, too. I've hunted several Beowulves and have been chased as a result. They don't tire, or if they do, I've never seen it. Fight it is, then. I let out a breath and charge at them. I aimed my sword at the next Beowulf, who had begun to take point with the remaining two behind it. Just as I thought, the Nevermores launched their attack as well. Two fired feathers. The other one went for a dive. I tried to strike it down, but I got cut by all the feathers. Blood trickling down my arms. Ugh, sons of bitches. The wounds stung for a moment before my aura began healing them. I switched maneuvers in order to dodge the attack. However, I did, I did, however, spin kick one of the rear Beowulves into the structure. Again, the aging metal creaked and a wooden platform fell. I rolled out of the way, skidding back. I rolled out of the way, skidding back to my feet, just in time to see the platform crush the two Beowulves. I looked up, barely dodging another strike from a Nevermore. I tried cutting it, but got pierced by more feathers. I shout out in pain, hoping that someone with an actual gun would run by soon, hearing howls in the distance. It only has been about half an hour since we left Beacon on a bulkhead to begin our initiation trial, and I was about ready to leap out of it. Not only was I crammed in amongst multiple other initiates, but my luck put me on the one with possibly the chattiest overly joyful person imaginable since the moment I arrived at the academy. Don't get me wrong, Esma was kind, but she never, ever shut up the entire ride. Even some of the other students who were forced to stand near her, trying to focus on the trial ahead of them, were getting annoyed at every word coming out of her mouth. And then, as I was running to my ride, I found this old man with a bunch of bandits surrounding him. At the time, I just thought he needed the dentist because the guys were trying to remove his tooth with a knife. <laughs> Knowing that it would hurt if they continued, I pointed the guy to the dentist I went to. He just needed to take a left, a right, then a left. Or was it two lefts and a right? No, it was right the first time. <laughs> Anyways! Before she could ramble on any further about her misadventures back in Vacuo, she would be cut off by the voice from the bulkhead's intercom. I didn't know who the pilot was, but I was thankful that they stopped her from continuing. Y'all better be ready back there. We'll be over Mountain Glen in five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes till we land, and maybe, oh, maybe, I could escape from this non-stop chatter.
Truth be told, I felt guilty plotting to leave Esma alone, but I'm sure she could handle herself. At least, that's what I gathered from how she rambled on and on about all the fights she's been through. Shouldering my bag, I would place my hand on the handle of my weapon. The Glade Blade may not have been anything special compared to some of the weapons everyone else had, but it was special to me. And my family. Besides, if I played my hand right, maybe I wouldn't have to use it a lot and let my traps do the work for me. Five minutes! Okay, then I better talk fast. So once the old guy left, the bandits got very mad and chased me through the alley. One was a good climber and threw his club at me. One nearly shot me, but I managed to dodge them. With some wind and gravity dust, I managed to knock them on their butts. But then I ran into the bandit leader. I thought that was going to be it for me there. But the old man from before listened to me and found the dentist, as well as a lot of friends, apparently because there was suddenly a lot of people to help. He threatened to slit my throat, but before he could, I used some dust to shock him and let me go. And that was what happened. I couldn't help but put my hand over her mouth. Not only was I nervous going into this, I had no time to focus or figure out some sort of game plan. I may have been smart enough to take a picture of the map with my scroll, but I would have preferred to have time to stare at it and form some sort of route and plan. Esma, we have about three minutes now until we are dropped off on the ground. Shouldn't you be worried about the initiation? Esma would pull my hand away from her mouth, which I wasn't sure if that was a good thing because that meant she was learning how to bypass the only method I had to get her to shut up. Why should I worry? It's just an initiation test. It can't be that hard. Honestly, the hardest part is probably just going to be finding the relic thingy. <laughs> Besides, worrying is only a bad thing. I mean, if the city was swarmed by Grimm to the point where it had to be abandoned with no hope of recovering it, wouldn't worrying just draw those Grimm to you? For a moment, I was kind of speechless. Here I thought she was a bit airheaded, but what she said was true. The more we actually worried, the harder it was going to be. I needed to calm down and relax. I had my weapon, I had my traps, I had a map, and they would be landing soon. Everything was going to be just fine. Suddenly, the door to the bulkhead would slide open, and the aircraft would tilt to the side, causing us all to fall out of the ship. What was going on? When they said they were going to drop us off, did they really mean they were going to drop us? Looking down, I would find myself and the others plummeting towards the ruined city below, skyscrapers soon whizzing past. I had to think, and think fast. Ugh, I knew I should have listened to my father and worked on my landing strategy. He tried to warn me about this. Before I could react, though, I felt something. No, someone grab a hold of me. Turning my head, I would see Esma had wrapped an arm around me with four arrows in her hand. Hold on tight, bestie! Before I could even hang on to her, she would fire an arrow at one of the skyscrapers we were zooming past, being blasted by an intense gust of wind, propelling us diagonally down the street. I looked ahead, seeing another building. I braced myself for impact, only to feel Esma draw her bow back once more, another gust of wind propelling us yet again, only this time starting to slow our fast descent. We would bounce off one more building before we were about fifteen feet from the roof of another. With her last arrow, she would fire it beneath us, the force of the wind slowing our fall just enough for us to roll across the roof relatively unharmed. With a grunt, I would roll out of Esma's grasp and sit up. I had a feeling I was going to feel that landing in the morning. If we made it out of this city in one piece. That was so much fun! I would look over at the girl like she was insane. She thought this was fun? We nearly died. <laughs> I want to do that again! That is the most airtime I've ever gotten with my air dust arrows! Oh, I wish I had more so I could go bouncing from building to building! It would be a blast! The view must be amazing! View! See! The girl would sit up and stare me in the eye. There! Eye contact has been made! We are officially partners! It would take me a moment, and the beeping of our scrolls, to process what she said. And then it hit me that I would now have to spend the next four years working with her. Note to self, invest in some earplugs or noise-canceling headphones. 
With a deep breath, a sigh, and a grunt, I would stand up. <sighs> yeah, I guess we are. Great. It's not just great, it's fantastic! I get to be partnered with my bestie! This will be so much fun! I barely knew this girl for an hour, and she thinks we were suddenly besties? That... that was just sad. Looking around the rooftop, I would read the decayed lettering at the top of the store. My mood suddenly getting a bit better despite learning I had been paired with Esma. Pulling back out my scroll, I'd look at the map, pinpointing our exact position. Okay, Esma. Looks like we need to get off this hardware store roof and start heading west. Let's take one of the roof hatches down. There's bound to be something I can use in this place to help us. We could. Or I can use some of my arrows and we can leap off the- No. Why not? The squirrel really was going to be the death of me. Isma, let me put it this way. Why should we risk our limited resources and aura doing something so reckless? Because it's fun, and I can do it with one, maybe two arrows. Just come down the trapdoor. I would say, already lifting the trapdoor open to find myself face to face with a bunch of thick spider webs accumulated at the top. With my sleeve, I'd wipe away most of it before further descending into this maddening situation. At the bottom, we would find ourselves in what appeared to be a janitorial closet full of old cleaning supplies and chemicals, all coated in dust and grime. Stepping out of the door into the hallway, I could immediately tell that if any creatures had decided to make this place home, it was the spiders. Honestly, it was like walking into a tunnel of spiraling web. There was just that much of it all over the place turned and knocked over shelves and filing cabinets, just acted as anchor points for the webs. I've never seen a web this big before. There's so much of it. And it's kind of fluffy and sticky, like cotton candy. Wait! I would turn around to see Esma pick a piece of web off the wall and taste it, immediately spitting it out. <laughs> nope! Not cotton candy! <coughs> that is not candy! <coughs> How? How has she lasted this long? God, I hope there was no insulation in the warehouse below, because I would not be surprised if she would taste test that too. Esma, this place has been left abandoned for years and probably contains so many dangerous substances. Don't just taste random things. After yelling, we would both hear something get knocked over beneath us. We would both go quiet and listen. The sudden silence was very unsettling. Before you ask, that was not me. I know. That's what concerns me. I would draw my short sword, Esma behind me, notching an arrow on her bow. Slowly, we would move towards the door with the very faded sign labeled Warehouse. Opening it would reveal the back storage area, a large warehouse lined with stacked shelves and boxes of old appliances, tools, supplies, and furniture. And it was all covered in large spider webs. Now, I was concerned, because while there was so much web, there was not a single spider of any size anywhere. Is it too late to go with my plan? No. And no, we aren't going through with it. Come on, it might have just been... The sound of shelves collapsing and falling down in the back corner of the warehouse would keep me from continuing my thought. Something was in here with us, and no student would make just that crashing noise. Looking around, we would continue to make our way down the staircase, immediately looking for an exit. I originally wanted to scour this place for any supplies that could be used to make a few traps, but given the circumstances, I did not 
want to be in this building any longer than I had to. After rounding the next corner, we would finally spot our exit. Come on, Esma, out this way. Zach! Before I knew it, I was tackled to the ground by Esma, a couple of boxes falling nearby us. Looking up, I would find myself face to face with the source of all of this web. It was a grim. A huge grim. A black spider with white, bone-like armor, its eight red eyes glowing in the surrounding darkness, its fangs as sharp as daggers and as thick as spears. I couldn't move. I was near paralyzed in fear. My heart was racing, but I couldn't think of what to do to fight a creature of this size. I had no time to set a trap. My weapon would probably only annoy it before it killed me. For that moment, I thought I was done for. Hey, Eight Eyes! Look over here! Before I knew it, I would see an arrow fly over my head and watch as it found itself right inside one of the spider's eye sockets. The Grim would let out a terrible hiss and retreated back a few feet towards the shelves. Turning back to Esma, I would see she had two more arrows notched, each tipped with a brown and red crystal. Dust? Wait! I could barely get that word out before she fired one of the arrows at the nearby shelf, the shelf suddenly exploding in a cloud of dirt and rock, its contents falling down and crushing the spider's back legs, rendering it incapable of escaping easily. Then she would fire the one I was most concerned about, the red-tipped one. On impact, it set the spider, the shelving, its former contents, and all the surrounding web ablaze. Before I could even process what happened next, I found myself being tugged along by Esma, who had grabbed hold of my prosthetic hand and was dragging me towards the exit, the fire chasing right behind us before we finally pushed through the door and out into the city streets. Phew, that was close. Good thing I snagged this cotton candy on the way up. <coughs> nope, <coughs> not cotton candy either. <coughs> I spent a majority of the time on the airship planning and preparing myself to do what I am proficient at. Hunting. Though hunting Grimm may not be the prey I normally hunt, I don't see it any different from going after a white fang. The objectives were clear and concise. Survive, find a partner, get to the extraction point. There was no chance for failure. I studied as much about Grimm as I could particularly grim that were common in the kingdom of Vale. I will execute this mission like I have every other task, with perfect precision. I let out a gentle breath, relaxing all thoughts except for those regarding the mission. The other would-be students around me were all excited about family legacies or becoming heroes. I could sympathize. I had the same mentality when my mother allowed me to join Eclipse. I could keep the citizens of Atlas safe from Fang members. Becoming a very proficient sniper and constantly told how much more amazing my mother was. So overcoming one's parents' reputation and carving your name in the history of hunters, I can understand. However, the participants in this initiation were so... underwhelming. Could they look a grim in the eye and fight, or will they freeze and die? My gut gave me the answers of freeze. It just made me sick. I just couldn't look at them. All I saw were graves to be dug. I let out a quick, gentle prayer to no one to make sure I was wrong. The bay doors opened, wind whipping my hair around. Everyone was shocked, but I didn't hesitate, immediately launching myself out of the aircraft. Even the air up this high in altitude felt warmer than Atlas on the ground. I let myself freefall, looking at any structures to land safely on. Unfortunately, I may have been a bit too hasty in leaving the airship, as there wasn't much except for what seemed to be a construction site nearby. I would curse my hubris later as I looked at the ground. Taking a breath, I held up my hand and summoned a light purple panel. I turned my body to bounce off the panel, summoning more panels until I landed safely on the ground. I swing around my assault rifle and extend the barrel slightly to give it a bit more range. I could hear distant fighting, 
Howls and screeches echoing throughout the quiet. I faced the structure and saw cat faunas fighting with just a sword. Beowulves and nevermore swarming him. His form was capable against those Beowulves, albeit not hard from all the documents I've read. Beowulves are the easiest to overcome. Nevermore, however, not as simple. Especially for this cat faunus who is just a blade. <laughs> a truly ignorant move. Just get in, <laughs> get out. Anyone dumb enough to not bring an answer to a long-distance enemy doesn't need to be a partner of mine. I flipped off the safety and just before taking the shot, I heard a growling behind me. I bite my lip in slight frustration. How did it sneak up on me? I tried to spin around to get a quick shot and was knocked to the side, causing me to roll to the side. I stood back up and saw three Beowulfs growling and drooling as they walked towards me. I let out another breath. I'm confident in my abilities enough that I am open to admitting to myself that I made a mistake. However, as I took aim, I now knew to never let that happen again. I fired three shots. All of them hit their targets. That was not a good enough hit to make them vanish into their dark mist. Beowulves may have been the easiest to hunt. That didn't mean they weren't durable. I flipped the switch to go to three-round burst and shot the one closest to me. It caused the Beowulf to stumble back from the bullets, hitting its hard, exposed helmet-like skull. It shakes its head and growls, and all three charge. I quickly set the rifle to the side and pull out the pistol on my left holster. This one was filled with dust-infused bullets. It took one red-dusted bullet to take the one closest to me out, the explosion sending the other two back. I held the pistol steady, splitting my attention to the surviving Beowulfs. They were slowly getting up. I moved my hand swiftly to the pistol on my right hip and fire both of them at once. Again, the dust-infused bullets make the last two Beowulfs disappear like their packmate before them. I put the pistols back in their holsters and looked back over to the cat faunus with my scope. He was still dancing around Beowulfs and nevermore. We must have landed in a grim, dense area. Just our luck. I tried getting a clear shot at the two Nevermore and realized that even with my skills, these stupid demon birds moved quicker. I stood back up and began running towards the construction area. All I have to do is avoid eye contact, and I can find a more decent partner. The sound of howls and screeches were becoming louder. The cat faunus was trying to slash at the Beowulfs, but every time he got close, feathers would be launched at them. I was close enough now to pull out my rifle and take aim. He had heard the near gunfire because I saw him from the corner of my eye take a quick glance. He seemed experienced, or at the very least smart enough, to not take his eyes off that grim that was slashing at him. The Nevermores turned their attention to me. I jumped back, dodging some feathers, and brought up a shield with my semblance reflecting the feathers in scattered directions. Keep them busy! The fauna shouted as he began to move towards the Beowulfs. There were four, and all of them charged at him. I lost sight of him in my peripherals, and the next second all the Beowulfs vanish. Hmm. Impressive. The gathering nevermore charged at me, thinking I was distracted. I shot quickly and efficiently in response and disposed of the stupid creatures. The faunus reappeared in the corner of my eye from the gathered dark mist of the Beowulf's carcasses. I just watched the birds slowly dissolve into mist. He stopped about five feet away from me. I wanted to thank you for your help. Nevermore, Art. You're a fool. If you can't save yourself from Grimm as simple as Nevermore, then you should just go home. The cat faunus blinked a few times. His tail swang as he thought about his next response. Well, in my experience, that's what the purpose of a team is for. They pick up the slack where you can't. Hearing those words echoed a similar piece of advice from my mother when I was first joining Eclipse. I sighed and looked away from him, still avoiding eye contact. He was efficient, yes, but I can't have a partner who can't stand on his own two feet. You may follow if you wish. Having someone watch my back could be beneficial. Though, remember this. The moment things get too overwhelming for either one of us, I am saving myself 
over you. Well, that's good. Now I don't feel so bad for feeling the same. I nodded my head and gestured to him to go first. He walked past me, equally careful to not look in my eyes. Some people would be insulted by this. I, on the other hand, took this as responsible. The partner we unlock eye contact with will be the partners that we will have through our entire career with Beacon Academy. He sheathed his sword, keeping his hand on the handle. Just seeing how he would look around, holding himself in a way that humorously reminded me of a cat on the prowl. He was somehow hyper-focused on his surroundings, while also being strangely relaxed. Hmm. He was an interesting faunus, that is for sure. We walked for what seemed like thirty minutes until the faunus stopped and looked into this tunnel. He squinted. Something feels... off. What do you mean? This cave isn't naturally made. Then we go in. He nodded and stepped inside. I followed five paces behind him. I could vaguely see the outline of him as we walked deeper into the dark tunnel. I heard him stop, and his head moved back. His tail went still. What is it? My voice was even, but the way he was acting was concerning. Just be extremely careful. Lots of grim. Where? Above us. I tried wiping my tongue of the disgusting taste of the whatever it was that wasn't candy. Nothing was getting it out of my mouth. It tasted like... sticky. If sticky was a taste, then that was the taste it would be. I looked at my best friend Clover, and she just shook her head. This must just be how people feel like greeting me, because I get it a lot. I just kind of laughed a little bit as Clover turned back to me and gestured toward a distant house. Come on, let's just, uh, forget this whole experience and get to that building. Okay. I notched an arrow in the string of my bow, not wanting to pull back. Clover led the way there. She was fiddling with something in her hands. I wonder if she was nervous. Nah, I'm sure she's fine. I mean, sure, we've had two near-death experiences since it started, and walking in a relatively open area where Grimm can be literally hiding anywhere to possibly ambush us. <laughs> I'm sure she's fine. So, what's your plan when we get into the house? Look around. If my map is correct, there should be a ladder leading to the underground. You... you remembered the entire map? Holy Neapolitan, my partner is amazing! We only had like five minutes to remember everything, and my partner succeeded! My best buddy is awesome! Wait, why is she looking at me confused? No, I just took pictures with my scroll. She pulled out her scroll, tapping the picture app and showing the pictures. It may have been a bit embarrassing that I didn't think of doing that myself, but the feeling was gone as quickly as it showed up. Who cares? My partner came up with it and that's all that matters for this team. I just smiled and hugged her. You're a genius! Esma, oxygen. I immediately let go and just squeezed her hand. <laughs> the same hand that I grabbed to get her out of the building. It felt different. I opened my mouth to ask about it, but something deep inside my brain told me to hold back. Which was weird because I never have those thoughts. In fact, most people say those thoughts should happen more often. Is something wrong with me? Is this because I ate that not cotton candy? Either way, I decided to follow that feeling and let go of her hand. She shook her head. Come on, let's go. We need to get somewhere quickly. It might be day, but with how dark these buildings are, it's almost a guarantee we'll be confronting Grimm. Like the spider! Yeah. Hopefully they won't be that large, though. The rest of the walk was quiet. I felt a combination of relief since we weren't overrun by Grimm, but also slight disappointment because I want to fight. Vacuo doesn't have much to do other than hunting Grimm, and I needed that right now. So even though I internally pouted, that meant that Clover was safe. Clover looked at me, eyeing my bow. I nodded and started pulling back, looking away. I heard her fiddling with the door probably looking for traps connected to the door. <laughs> that reminded me of so many times I would be trying to sneak around and explore a cave, and then BOOM! Cave in! 
I felt Clover's hand on my shoulder, and I started backing up until I was in the house and closed the door. You're so awesome! Clover was about to put her hand over my mouth again, but then we heard other human voices. She held her short sword as we waited for the sources of the voices to show themselves. So then there was milk everywhere. Sounds absolutely disgusting. You're lucky to have made it out alive. Yeah, well, you know, I'm the strongest in my family. Two guys walked down a set of stairs before us. One was super short, tan with blue hair, white tank top, and some torn jeans holding a baseball, and a stench that made even me want to gag. The other one was super tall, messy black hair, a red and black trench coat, and silver pauldrons, and what seemed like a reinforced shirt underneath, black pants, and a big sword and shield, which had a bishop chest piece emblazoned on it. He didn't have a bad stench. Clover seemed tense. I have a bad feeling about these guys. The voice was just above a whisper. My eyes narrowed, really focusing on the guys. I couldn't really figure out why they were giving off bad vibes. Bad stench, sure. Unfortunately for Clover, the short one looked over and saw us. He smiled, showing screwed up teeth. He really should see my dentist friend. As he walked over, his body was held a little stronger? It was weird. Well, hello, ladies. Glad to see you're all mostly unscathed. A little singed, but still gorgeous as ever. Oh, so that's why there are bad vibes. Because I couldn't explain it, but there was a strong urge to make him eat one of my red dust arrows. At the same time, Clover and I took a step back away from him. Oh, come on. I know this place is scary, but you're with two very capable hunters. Indeed. It would be beneficial for us to stick together regardless. We're fine. We're just here to find the trapdoor to the underground. Huh? What do you mean, the, uh, underground? Did you... not pay any attention? Yeah! Even I knew that the thing for the... teachers is underground. Though I feel like a shovel would work too. Esma, there are tunnels underground. Someone already did shovel. Oh, nice! Psh, of course we knew that! We're geniuses! I looked at the other guy who looked just as confused as the blue-haired one. Did neither of them know? We just want to make sure you knew. Well, anyways, it doesn't matter. We're here and you're here, so uh, let's get to talking and uh, planning. You're a pushy one. We said no. I just noticed something. When Clover looked at the cat faunus, she got all red and nervous. But here, she's still red, but it's more like <sighs> red. Look, if it's about not immediately remembering the underground, it's because I smashed into the goddamn fountain, okay? Stupid faunus getting around. Oh, you despise the vermin too? Hell yeah, I do! Wait, you were the rocket? Was it fun? It looked fun. Dangerous too, but honestly, what's more fun than dangerous stuff? I mean, we're here in the middle of nowhere with the possibility of dying, and we're still here! Oh, shut up. Jeez. No, it wasn't fun. It was fucking embarrassing. I'm the strongest of my family, and I got fucking cheap-shotted by a stupid, moody dog faunus. <sighs> they should just be put down if they're going to be needlessly violent. Then, something sent a jolt of realization through my brain. These guys were racist! I felt my jaw tense. I didn't like this feeling, but oh boy, did those guys deserve it. What's wrong with Faunus? They just have some cool appendages. That's all. And you said you were geniuses and amazing hunters or whatever. So then how did you get punched? Esma, you need to calm down. But these guys are being jerks! I understand, but... Ah, uh, the hell do you know, anyways? Look, you hot as fuck, but I still will not hesitate to beat your... ass. We heard the marching pack of creeps coming closer. I looked out the window, seeing them far off. There had to be at least 20 of them. I gulped and looked back at everyone. So, company is on the way. Look what y'all done now. 
You pissed Esma off with your racism and stupidity, and now we have a bunch of Grimm approaching. I'm sorry. Don't you fecking apologize for these two being bastards. She dug through her bag and held up a handful of small balls. She took a step outside and threw the handful. She immediately closed the door, spun around, and looked at us. Not my usual choice of trap. I like a little bit more intricacies in my traps, but these will do. Once these explode, get your arses out there and take care of the survivors. What are you going to do? Oh, I'm looking for the trapdoor. I'll call for you when I find it. It was a strange feeling, 